Hello, 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 and welcome back to Alice Talks Football, and welcome back to a live Manchester United news show. And when I say this is an action-packed show with lots to get into, I mean it is literally lots to get into, and I haven't even made that bigger. That's very small. But there's a lot of news to get through in today's show. And I'm going to start with the transfer news, then we'll get into the news on the takeover, then we'll get into news on Eric Tenog and his future and more. There's been a lot of news about Jal Nevers and him being a serious target for United. And I've always said, you know, I'm not 100% sure if we're going to really be going for Jal Nevers because he will be about £80 million. And I think Man United might be in a position where they're with the restrictions and with the fact that we probably need five, six positions addressed that we might cap it at £60 million per signing. But for Brits Romano, sort of confirmed that United do genuinely have an interest, genuinely have an interest in Jal Nevers. They are, you know, sort of assessing the situation, which is very interesting report coming out. On top of that, uh, we've also got news confirmed by Academy Scoop. Now, Academy Scoop confirmed that Mayler was going to make his debut. They confirmed that Toby Collier was going to be on the bench. And they come on to confirm that Forson was going to start the day, the day before they actually did. And they've been right with every bit of information they've had surrounding the academy. They were right when they said we were going to sign the Fletcher Twins last year. Academy Scoop has confirmed that United have officially completed a deal for a young fullback. We're going to get into that player, that signing, who is, again, very similar to the Harry Amas situation. But Ineos and Manchester United have completed some sign a signing for a young fullback. We know that Ineos also got loaned with an option to buy for Bufundi um, with the plan of potentially having this multi-club network that would use Nice, Lausanne and United. And Salino could be brought and loaned to Nice. Uh, but more importantly, we've been linked to a lot of youngsters like Talis um, and, and loads of interesting players. And I want to dive into that later in today's show, talk about the multi-club network and some of the youngsters we're looking at in and around South America and even some young Serbian and Croatian players we're looking at with the idea of loaning them to Nice and Lausanne as well. So I want to dive into that. There is a lot to get into, but please do hit that like button. Of course, subscribe down below and see you. Let's get into it as well. Good morning, everybody in the chat. Um, I am going to get into the Marvin Bell reports as well that has been reported. I'm going to get into that news. I'm going to get into the majority of the news. But let's dive into the first signing by Academy Scoop. Exclusive. Manchester United have completed a deal to sign Lincoln Fagbone from Bradford. Very interesting surname. Uh, the young fullback was pursued by Brighton, Liverpool, Wolves and Manchester City. United's Academy Recruitment Department are aiming for a busy summer with more signings to follow. This is one of those out of the blue deals. I'm going to take my coat off because I don't know why I'm wearing a coat. I'm indoors. This is one of those out of the blue deals. We were not linked to this guy. I've never heard of this guy before today. We were not linked to this guy. With the Fletcher twins, we were linked to them for a bit and we signed them. With Harry Amos, we were linked to him for a bit and then we signed them. This is another one of those young academy deals for a young fullback. The United have gone and they've basically got it done. The deal is complete. He'll join at the end of the academy season. He'll join at Manchester United in the summer as well. Um, so let's dive into why this is good and why this is important as well. So if you look at this deal here, do I follow Bradford City? No, I don't follow Bradford City. Do I follow Bradford City's academy? No. Do I know if this player is any good? No, I don't. But what do I know? That City, Wolves and Brighton and Liverpool are looking at him. What else do I know? Last year, we signed the Fletcher twins, particularly Jack Fletcher. That's been super impressive. And I think they'll be on pre-season. We signed Bian Shiri last summer, who's been really impressive. And obviously, a lot of you have been talking about Harry Amas with the fullback situation. But last year, we signed a young fullback in Harry Amas. Now we're signing a young fullback in Lincoln Fagburn. Manchester United are very, very good. And this is the one area of the club I probably won't criticise over the last 10 years. The one area I won't criticise is academy recruitment over the last 10 years. Everything else, it can be massively and heavily criticised. But it was said that, obviously, United are bringing this guy in. But remember, we brought in Toby Collier. Garnacho, Fernandez, Gerardo, Mejbri, McNeil and Hugo in recent years. And of course, most of these players won't make it at United, but most of these players we will make a profit on. Most of these players will go, go on to have good careers. Garnacho has made it at United. Mejbri we can get a little bit of money for. Um, Fernandez we can get a little bit of money for. And then you've got the Fletcher twins, Harry Amas, that could potentially make it at United. And this young fullback, you never know, could be our next Mano that saves us a bit of money. So I wanted to get that news out of the way. It was a little bit out of the blue. It was a little bit under the radar news that no one's really been talking about. But yeah, Collier, uh, Dangle doing good at Port Vale. 
Uh, Gerardo le has left Hugo's at Burton. Yeah, obviously Gerardo's left. That was sort of a situation with him being homesick. But Gerardo, I rated him really, really highly. Barcelona Academy, I rated Mark Gerardo very highly. It's a shame that he left, but I think there was a lot of homesickness issues going on there as well. Alice, what do you think of Dominic Solanke as a Hoyland backup? It really depends on the price tag. I think my first choice would be Xerxes as a Hoyland backup, followed by Sesco in all honesty. I'm just going to adjust that there as well. Any else want things to be done quickly and I love it. Yeah, any else getting that deal done quick over the line is what we want to see as well. Let's continue on to the Jao Neves story. So this was said by Sport Witness and Record Portugal. Now Record Portugal do like a little bit of waffle when it comes to United because they know that we get clicks, but we know the Jao Neves interest is there. We know United genuinely would really like Jao Neves and can you blame them? He's, he's bloody good. Um, it was said that Manchester United have more than 100 million euros ready to convince Benfica to sell Jao, sell Jao Neves. So when I look at that story, I think... What a load of rubbish. Do you know what I mean? I think there's no way we have 100 million euros to, to sell, them, you know, Benfica, Jan Evers. I don't personally believe that bit of the story. But they continue to say, Manchester United scouted the 19-year-old many times this season and will once again send an official to do so tonight in Benfica's derby against Sporting. This came out yesterday. Manchester United is said to be delighted with a very good season Nevers has been having and they want him to be playing with Bruno Fernandes in their midfield. Bruno Fernandes, Jao Neves, Kobe Main in midfield. It's a very good midfield. It lacks height, it lacks physicality, it lacks a natural six because I think Kobe and Jao Neves are very similar players. But Jao Neves is such a talented player that I, I would still be absolutely gassed if we signed him. I think we need a number six. I think we need a Matt Smitha, Amadou Anana, tall type profile. I think we need two midfielders. I think we should sign a Matt Smitha and I think we should sign a Jao Neves and I think we should let go of Mutsom Nerex and Amrabat Casemiro. That's what I think we should do. But interestingly, you know, this is coming out from Portugal. In Portugal, like Italy, when they when they they often sort of ex links between Manchester United players and their stars and the media to get clicks. But Fabrizio Romano, again, pretty much confirmed this news and again, interested in Jao Neves. Fabrizio Romano said on Jao Neves to Manchester United that Jao Neves is one of the players Manchester United are following and United will follow him closely, waiting to see how much they'll need to invest in him at the end of the season. So my question to you guys is, would you drop 80 million on Jao Neves? Man United are following him, they're watching him closely and they're waiting to see how much they'll need to invest. I think it's a situation where if Jao Neves is available for 60, 70 million, United pay the money. I don't know if any of us are going to stretch to do any deals in the 80, 90 million mark, but I think if he's a little bit under his 100 million euro asking price, which often happens, and he's in that 60, 70 million range with how good he is, with how talented he is, how many boxes he ticks off Ineos with confirmation that Ineos want a midfielder. I think there's a real possibility of maybe them making a move on Jan Evers. Now, I'm going to be honest, um, I never thought United would go for Jan Evers, and I still don't think we'll probably sign Jan Evers this summer because I think there's five, six positions to address, and we need a mid like a, we do need a midfielder, but I think they might prioritise a more six type midfielder. But I'd really like Jan Evers. I think he's a fantastic player. I have a feeling we're not going to get him this summer, but you don't know. I, I would be surprised if you were going to get him this summer. Anana Weefer and Edson and Kuhlman from Sporting as Casemiro and Eriksen replacement. Yeah, we need one of those kind of players and then maybe a Jao Neves. On top of it is Mel. Uh, better than 60 million for Mount. I mean, that's the mad thing. Imagine getting Jao Neves for 65 million. It's only 10 million more than Mason Mount. That is that, that is crazy. I do want to talk about Mason Mount because obviously he's come out and spoke about his struggles as well. Uh, Jao Neves, Benfica want 86 million. We won't spend that much on a tight budget, 100%. I do think that when they want 86 million, deals could be done for around the 70 million mark. I don't see us getting Jao Neves, but I think if the price goes below 80 million, maybe United get Jao Neves as well. Uh, guys, please do that like button and of course subscribe down below if you're new and share the video. We've got lots of info to get into. Let me know in the chat. How much would you drop on Jan Evers? I could drop 70 million on him. I could only drop 80 million on him if we sell well. In an ideal scenario, we sign Jan Evers, we sign either Matt Sweep or Amadou Anana or one of those sort of sixes that you named, Edson Hulman. In an ideal world, we sign a tall physical player that can play as a six as an eight. Jan Evers, a young fullback, which we're going to get into, a link to a fullback, Todobo Brownthwaite, Cirque Elise. That's the ideal world for me. But this is Manchester United and to do that we're going to have to sell and if and when it comes to selling we're not very good 
Now, we have been linked to other players on the transfer front that I do want to get into. People are saying 60s, 60s. I'm the same as you, as good as Shell Nevis is. I don't. I think if we were in a position where we'd come second this season and our squad was good, I'd be willing to drop 80 million on Jan Evers. But because we need investment at centre back, because Martinez is injured, we'll get into that full back, wing, striker, two midfielders. I think 60s is the most I could go for Jan Evers as well. I do agree with you guys. We've also been linked to other players in the transfer market. And I want to dive into a little bit of story that came out from the mail. It said that Manchester United are expected to be in the market for a centre forward, central midfielder and a right back this summer. The budget will once again be limited by FFP restrictions, but they hope to raise up to 100 million in player sales. And we're going to talk about who they may be in a second. This summer, FFP is definitely going to have impact on things. This summer, FFP is definitely unfortunately going to get in the way of things i think but it's about how we sell if i generally think how much we spend this summer and who we buy is so determined on who we sell i think there'll be three players we'll buy but if we want to buy five six players and we need five six players we're going to need to sell well now one of the players we want and one of the players that again is a little bit expensive we're talking 65 70 million is jared bramthwaite and that man united are really like jared bramthwaite but they're waiting to see what the price is everton are talking at 75 million but that's the initial starting price how much will he actually be because if he's 60 million we can afford to spend 60 million on bramthwaite but if he's 75 million that's when we're going to walk away because we don't want mcguire gate you've got to look at omar brada omar brada will start in june omar brada wanted harry mcguire he was willing to pay 60 million when they said it's 80 million. Oh my God, I walked away. He got Ruben Diaz for 60 million. We need to do similar with Bramfway. As good as he is, the 80 million on the centre back, you can get Antonio Silva, who's arguably, other than he's not Premier League proven, better on the ball, just as good. It's just that Bramfway can play left centre back and with Martin as his injuries, we might need that. And it was said that United are waiting for Everton to put a price on Bramfway. I think Bramford will be in the sixty-five million pound mark. You've got to think about um, sort of what Harry Maguire went for. You've got to think of what what Guardia went for at a similar age. You've got to look at the set of that market. It has become very, very expensive. Ben White was fifty million a couple of years ago. So this year, Ben White will probably be the equivalent of sixty million. You've got to look at how much Maguire went for. You've got to look at how much Guardia went for to Manchester City. The centre-back market, unfortunately, is very expensive. Now, United probably are looking to sign two centre-backs, just not just the one centre-back, which makes things interesting. And one player we've been linked to is Aaron Anselimo, that's only 18 years of age. And this was said by the Mail Sport. It was said that Manchester United have asked figures about 18-year-old Boca Juniors and Salimo, and are also looking at Barcelona B under-19 centre-back Michali Faye. Now, interestingly, Anselimo has been linked to Manchester United quite a bit over the last two weeks, but we've not been linked to Faye. But I actually got a little bit of information a week ago about Faye. I don't know if you saw my tweet, but we had this is before we've been linked to Faye. But the mayor was almost confirming information that I received because I tweeted this um, just over a week ago. And I said that United were looking at Aaron Anselimo and Faye. And at that time, everyone was talking about Anselimo, but no one credible had linked us to Faye. It's now been confirmed by another source that we're looking at Anselimo and Faye. So the mayor obviously sort of saying what I spoke about last week in my little bit of exclusive update here. And obviously, this is what I said last week. I said two of the late centre back targets United have been linked with today are Aaron Anselimo and Michali Faye. Anselimo has been linked to the club a couple of times before this week and has a reported 17 million release clause. So he could be brought in as a second centre back signing after acquiring a more experienced one. It was said that Anselimo has often been compared to his fellow countryman Romero and the 18-year-old centre-back is highly rated in Argentina due to his immense athleticism, anticipation, tenacity, determination and technical ability on the ball. He's very comfortable in possession and some argue has the capability to play DM, that John Stone's kind of role. For a young player who already possesses great reading of the game with positional awareness, I think this could be an exciting long-term signing. This is a guy that we might be bringing signing and apparently we're actually having formal talks with Buckle Juniors according to some reports and we're going to dive into that in a second but this is a guy we could be interested in signing and loading out to nice again the muppeteers said there's an interest in us loading him out to nice and I, and I spoke about this here. This was, again, a little bit of insight news on what was going on in this front. It said that Ineos are looking to use a multi-club network, United, Nice and Lausanne, which explains the recent focus on recruiting young talents. But Funde has been signed alone with an option to buy one. Man United have approached Boca about Anselimo to gauge a Ross Price. He has a rumoured release cost of £15 million with the plan of signing him and loaning him to Nice. That, again, has been confirmed by the Mail. 
Muppeteers and other sources. Kamada, Faye, Estabo, William, and other names were being explored or rated by Ineos. Ineos' shot move for Italian talent, but Funde, rare for Italian players to leave, shows they have a serious plan to sign young talent across Nice United and Lausanne. I would not be surprised if new unexpected names between of players between 15 to 19 get linked to United. But I think Anselimo is one that could really, really heat up on the centre back front. And that might be a potential sign of us signing Tordebo. There's reports and indications that Manchester United are going to go out there and sign Tolibo and and then loan and then sign Anselimo and loan Anselimo to Nice in return for maybe getting Tolibo on the cheap from Nice as well. Midfielders, Ericsson, Mejbri, Mutomo, Donny, Amrabat need to be moved on. Man, you need three world-class midfielders. 100% agree with that as well. Uh, we've got, we will talk about the Bremer stories as well. Bramthwaite and Neves will cost um, North 150 mil. Can't see happening for two players. But we need at least two in defence, midfield and winger. Yeah, I can see us maybe signing Bramthwaite. I feel like we're more likely to drop the money on Bramthwaite, particularly with Martinez's as injuries, than than Neves because I still think a more physical player might be seen as the priority in midfield because of the physical and athletic flooring of the squad is very, very poor. Um, I, I think if we sell well, we could get both, but I don't. I'm not confident who we're going to sell. Now, let me know in the chat if you want me to do a video talking in detail about some of the players uh, Ineos are looking at, because here are some of the players that we might they might bring in. Profunde's already at the Son. Luka, they make that permanent. And Salimo, Stavo, Kamard. Kamard is one being looked at. Thomas Palmer is being looked at. Faye's being looked up. And now Talis is being looked at looked at and these are some of the players that Ineos exploring I might do a video tonight or maybe tomorrow breaking down the eight youngsters that Ineos have got on their list to sign for 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 not just United but Nice and Lausanne and eight youngsters they're looking at so let me know if you've been interested in the video where I spoke in more detail about some of these players and and I'll give you a little bit more insight on what Ineos are planning to do with these signings Lausanne and Nice and the multi-club network and really give you a little bit of information about Ineos's plan to use multi-club network who they bring to Nice who they bring to United who they bring to Lausanne and if you, if you want to see that in more detail, do subscribe. I might plan to do that later on. We're 47 likes away from 100 likes. We've got 250 people watching, guys. So please do if not already. And, of course, subscribe down below if you're new. We need to seek. Yeah, I mean, look, we just, we're just athletically poor, not just physically. But I think we struggle to cover ground off the ball athletically core. We need physical players. We need players that are good off the ball. That's why I think Amadou Anand is what we need. Um, Mustafa makes a good point. Fabrizio Romano did repost about Tolibo post, maybe Enos working on a deal with him and Bramfleet centre-backs. Potentially, I think Tolibo and Anselimo are the two to watch. I think Bramfleet we really like, but that's going to depend on price. I think Tolibo is looking the most realistic. In terms of transfers, if I had to say if I had to say the two transfers I think are most likely to happen, it would be Tolibo and Elise right now. Sitting here from what I know and what's been reported, I'd say Tolibo and Elise are looking like two of the most likely transfers to happen in the summer at Manchester United as well. We will talk about Martin as we will talk about the injury situation in a second. Zoe says, Alice, realistically, a total overhaul of players will not happen in one window. How many seasons would you give Ineos for the regime? You've got to give them three years to implement a long-term plan and strategy before you can fully judge, but we have to see progress in each of the three years um, to, to see that we're moving forward as a club. I need to see progress this summer, see improvement. Then next time I need to see more progress than three years, I think, is when you judge because they'll have enough time to do stuff then. Hmm. So thirsty. Uh, get me these guys. John Claire Tolibo, Jab Brown, Freight, Matt Sweeper, or Amadou Anana, Robinson, Elise Sesco. I agree. That would be ideal. And then Chachi Anevers on top of that. That would be amazing. Let's dive back into the news. Let's dive back into the info. Because as I've said, and as I showed you at the beginning of the live stream, there's so much information and news to get into. Like So far, we've just spoke about the academy signings coming in. Um, obviously, if you have just joined, we've completed a deal for Lincoln, Fagbra from Bradford. Top young fullback being pursued by top sides. A bit like Harry Amas, obviously, Jal Nevers, you know, I'm really looking at. But Victor Romano said that we are following Jal Nevers and closely wait to see how much he'll cost. And now we've got confirmation about the budget, the positions we're looking at, looking at brown weight. But also, you've got to remember the mail said that United have asked about figures for 18 year old Boca Junior centre back and Salimo. Even though he's got a rumoured release cost of 15 million, Man United might be trying to see if they can get that deal done for. The 12 million. Newcastle went from relegation to Champions League battle quite quickly. Should be should be at least progressing from the off. 100%, 100% as well. Outs need to happen before ins, otherwise we don't remove the ever-growing debut. We need to make sure outs get done quickly this summer. And one thing I do want to tell you, and a little bit of interesting information that's not being really reported much in the media, is that Ineos have sent John Murta on lots of trips to have meetings with sporting directors. John Murta was sent to Saudi Arabia to say that Brand, Casemiro, Anthony Sancho were open for offers. John Murta has been meeting representatives of Atletico Madrid, all these clubs in Spain, in an attempt to sell Greenwood. John Murta has been told basically 
specifically to build relationships with the director of football of all, all these clubs, tell them who's for sale, build relationships. But John Mert has also been involved in these online calls throughout January where clubs like Manchester United, Southampton, Leipzig were present and they spoke about players that would be willing to sell and offload in the summer. So John Mert has been put to work by Ineos, you know, because it feels like John Mert and Richard Arnold haven't done any work the last few years, but they've actually been put to work to Ineos to establish relationships and stuff. Obviously, they're having fun going abroad and stuff. But United are really, really interested in selling, which collects, which wants me to continue in to the next story. This is a story that's probably come out about half an hour ago, if that. This story literally broke just before I went live as well. City linked to Nevers as they need a good new placement. I have a feel, I have a weird feeling John Nevers is going to go to Manchester City and be the next best player in the world. Sadly, I do. I sadly do. Problem is, Mercer is viewed as a joke, even an interim until those gardening leaves are sorted could be better. And I think Alex makes a point. The problem is, if Man United want to negotiate deals with Murta, if Man United and Murta comes in, they'll say, let's put the price tag up 20 million because Murta's the idiot that spent 85 million on Anthony. You know, let's see if we can get Sancho on loan because Murta's the idiot that will just get rid of anyone because he can't sell them. That's the problem as well. That's the one that's. That's the one. That, that's the problem as well. Um, continuing on as well, um, I wanted to quickly dive into this news, but I do agree with Alex's comments of maybe we should have brought in a, a temporary, uh, temporary director of football, sort of, because I, I, Murta's reputation is in the mud. It was said here by Nisar Kinsella that Manchester United are in contact with Nice's Melbourne Bard as the club focuses on signing a new left back this summer. So this was the first report that came out. I'm going to get into some more info by him in a second. He's come up with a lot of interesting information. Um, Manchester United will sign a fullback this summer. I don't know who will sign. I think it will be someone quite cheap, someone quite under the radar. But I can see us dropping £15 million pounds on a fullback. And this is Melbourne Bard. It's who we've been linked to, which doesn't really surprise me. I think this is definitely one to keep an eye on. But this is the first real links to him. But you've got to remember, N Nisar was the first journalist to link us to Elise. Then a week later, you had the Ornstein's, the Whitwells, all the reliable sources confirming our Elise interest. Nassar's been very accurate with his reports on the Man United transfer targets because he'll say something and he links us to Elise very early on, so this is probably going to be an Ineos priority target. And now everyone else has been linking us to Elise since, and we hadn't properly been linked to Elise by credible reports before that. So I do think that Melvin Bard is one to keep an eye on. Dio Rosea said that United are monitoring uh, Palmares, Wonderkid, Talis, and that it was also now said by the United Muppeteers a couple of days later that United could sign Talis and loan him out to Nice. And Salimo, Talis are players that United are exploring to sign and loan out to Nice. There's other 16 year olds that Manchester United are exploring over in South America. And again, do subscribe because I think I'm going to get a video out tonight talking about the players that we plan to sign, the players we plan to sign and loan out to Nice, the players that Nice and Ineos will sign with the goal of sending them to United. But there's about eight players in South America that could honestly be coming to United this summer. So if you want me to do content covering that, who could go to Nice, who could go to United, what the situation is, what the news is, and give you a little bit about this player, why they're so good, why they're so highly rated. Do subscribe for that because I'll probably do a video on that tonight. But I also want to dive into the outs because I think the outs this summer is as important as the ins, if not arguably more important as well. Um, so I do want to talk about some of the players that will be sold. Alice, exactly. If Myrtle if Mur is negotiating, we could be in trouble. Uh, United want to try and sign players from the championship. I don't think it's about where you sign players from. I think it's good to sign lots of young players that are unknown in development, and then you need to sign some players that are known. You need to sign a mix of players. But I see people crying that we're going to be signing uh, Branthwaite from Everton. They're saying Branthwaite's at Everton, at least he's at Palace. Why are we signing them? Where did Wayne Rooney come from? Where did we sign Wayne Rooney from when he was a kid? Everton. Where's Brownfoy from? Everton. Where's John Stones from? Everton. I saw someone moaning and crying about when we were linked to Amadou Anana and Brownfoy saying we can't be signing players from Everton with Manchester United. Manchester United's arguably in top five best ever players. Wayne Rooney is from Everton. If you do your scouting right and you buy players that are good and young from Everton and develop them properly, you can get Wayne Rooney. I'm not saying that Brownfoy is going to be the setback equivalent of Wayne Rooney, but he can be. OK, it's not about, oh, you know, they're from Nice, they're from Bristol Palace. Wayne effing Rooney. Is Wayne Rooney a good signing? Come on. Wayne Rooney's one of, I think Wayne Rooney's one of the most underrated players because he didn't get crazy goal numbers for a striker, but his all-round play, his ability to assist. Wayne Rooney was incredible and he came from Everton. So I don't mind, mind assigning players from Everton. I don't. 
Um, continue on, no, no. I want to get into a few reports and news. 75 likes, big up everybody in the chat. 25 likes off the 100 like target, so that would be really appreciated if you do at the bell as well. Everton are the farm team following players away from Liverpool and Championship do have a good crop of talent. They've got that Archie Gray kid that looks decent. Elise as they came from the Championship. Drew Bellingham came from the Championship. You know, Joe Bellingham, you know, he's in the Championship doing quite well. I don't think he'll be anywhere near the levels of G, but he looks good. There's some really talented players in the championship. Who's that player at Sunderland? It's not Joe Bellingham. Um, but they've got a really good young player at Sunderland. Um, and it wasn't Joe Bellingham. I forgot what his name was. Um, Joe, Joe oh, Sunderland. I'm trying to think. Let me. What was his name? Sunderland squad. There's someone I really like the look of at Sunderland. And it's not Joe Bellingham. Uh, his name has completely left my mind um, of who it was. But there was one guy at Sunderland that I think could be a top, top player. But that that's obviously left my is completely off my mind. But there's obviously Joe Bellingham there as well. If, if someone knows who I'm thinking of, I, I just remember watching two Sunderland games, only two Sunderland games, and this one guy just stood out for me. And that sounds weird, but it's, and it wasn't Joe Bellingham. I think he was only like 20 as well. Uh, might be Jack. It might be Jack Clark. Yeah, it might be Jack Clark. Uh, guys, 83 likes, so please hit that like button. And of course, subscribe down below if you're new. Every club produces and develops good and bad players. It's about the right sort whenever they come in. 100%, there's going to be good players, there's going to be bad players, but you want to get the right players with the right attitude and all of that as well. But yeah, Jack Clark looks really, really good as well. Uh, Wharton at Blackburn. Wharton from Blackburn's look really good. Archie Gray at Leeds. There's some really good players in the Championship as well. Alice of Mertes negotiating our transfers again. We're better off paying 20 million for Dan Ashworth says Gene is here. Do you guys agree with Gene is here? I mean, I don't want to give in and pay 20 million for Ashworth just because if we pay 20 million for Ashworth, then clubs will be like, okay, well, Ineos will pay the money if you hold them out long enough. I feel like if Ineos make a stance and don't pay 20 million for Ashworth and Newcastle lower their price, it sends a message into the transfer window of, look, Ineos aren't here to overpay. Like, this is a different United you know, we're negotiating with. You know, um, Atalanta told Hoyland he could leave for £50 million. Had Manchester City gone in to sign Rasmus Hoyland, he would have left Atalanta for £50 million. We bought him for £64 million and £12 million add-ons because John Mercer approached Atalanta and said, right, the most we're going to pay is £60 million. Atalanta would have been willing to do something for £50 million. Mercer made it clear he would have been willing to do something for £60 million. He was sold for £64 million with add-ons going to £72. Had Man City gone for Rasmus Hoyland, he would have gone for £50 because teams know they can bump the price up when Manchester United are interested in a player and when Manchester United are interested in signing a player. So if we go and pay to for Dan Ashworth, that's that's what we normally do. If we hold it out and get Dan Ashworth for £10 million, clubs will be like, you know what, this is a different United where if they don't get the player they want, they'll just walk away and go for someone else. Look at Omar Barada. Manchester City wanted Maguire, but as soon as he went over £60 million, they said, F off, we're going to go and get Ruben Diaz. And Manchester City don't get mugged off in the transfer market. That's something that United apparently plan to recreate with Omar Brada coming in. So talking about the transfer outs, because what we're going to do depends on outs. It was so that United could sell Sancho, uh, Greenwood, Anthony, Varane and Casemiro this summer, who could raise money. I'd like to see Miltomine sold. I'd like to see Ericsson offloaded. I'd like to see Lindelof sold as well on top of that. But I don't mind Man United selling those players, but I would personally keep Rafael Varane. I would. I think if you if, look, if, we, if, we, if Rafael Varane's contract's extended and you get a 30 million offer from Saudi, you think, well, this guy's only going to be here another year. We upset that, but don't let Rafael Varane walk on a free, especially if he's willing to neg negotiate a new wage that is lower. I think it would be absolutely silly if we let Rafael Varane walk out of United on a free. It was also said that Manchester United want a forward capable of playing alongside Rasmus Hoyland, a centre-back and a midfielder this summer as well. So, you know, if we, if we want to address all those positions, we've got to sell properly. Big up Steve in the chat. McKenna's under, um, under consideration for the managerial proposition. We will talk about the manager situation in a second, but McKenna's being looked at by United, a number of clubs, even Ajax. I'd keep around 100%, but I'm worried about his long-term talk, health for talks of concussion. True, maybe he wants to retire. I don't know what his plan is. Um, he Martinez is injured. Um, Maguire, Lindelof is injured. Evans is injured. Maguire's been on and off of injured. Like Rafael Varane has been our most reliable centre back this season. Um, and he sort of talk, talked about as unreliable. He's been the most reliable. Uh, Xerxes, uh, Xerxes, the striker I'd go for. Xerxes, according to Florian Plettyberg, that's a good source, is going to be 35 million this summer as well. Why do you think we're getting so many injuries? Um, I think it's a mixture of things. The medical staff is bad, a little bit of luck. But also, I do think those leaks about Ten Hag isn't helping. 
there's been leaks ever since August, July, August, June, July. There's been leaks since leaks since pre-season, and the fact that these leaks happened in pre-season before we even had a bad season is quite telling. That basically Eric Tenard in in the week does intense training, which is causing more people to get injured. If, if you look at Manchester City were asked about what they do in the week. And Manchester City, because they play two matches a week and they play two intense matches a week, they're saying in the week we have lighter training sessions that are more tactical. Um, whereas at Manchester United, the players are complaining that it's always intense running-based exercises and they don't do enough tactical work so they don't understand the tactics. It, look, I think our players make excuses. Our players are, are often making excuses and I'm not saying that's an excuse for the bad performance. I think mean, that's completely to blame. But I do think that Tenog is doing intense training throughout the week when other clubs do lighter training, more tactical work, whereas Tenog is doing heavy drills and athleticism work, which I understand why Tenog is doing because our squad is incredibly unfit and we're less fit than everyone else. But if we keep running and running and running and having no rest period, they're going to overwork themselves and have burnout. But I do think that maybe part of Tenog's training is contributing to injuries. I think the poor medical staff is contributing to injuries. They cleared Casemiro to play the other week. Casemiro then went to a doctor and said, no, you're not safe to play. Martinez has been rushed back three times. I mean, obviously, one of the times against West Ham, we couldn't do anything about. But Martinez was rushed back in September. His foot injury hadn't healed. Luke Shaw was rushed back. He hadn't healed. And of course, these players have a say and they choose to play and choose not to play. But the medical staff have rushed players back. Tenog's management of certain players hasn't been great. And I think the training re regime, I think it's a number of things. I don't think there's one person to blame, but I think there's a number of things contributing to sort of the injury crisis going on at United. Uh, tactics not fully helping. Eric Tenog called our play tennis. Yeah, that's as well. When you actually look at how open we are, it's not that we're jogging around. We're having to sprint, sprint, sprint. The way we play, the way we train, the tactics, it's... It's not helping us at all. It's not helping us at all. And there's a reason why probably only Newcastle have been hit with worse injuries than us this season as well. Um, I've never seen a time in the 80s and 90s where players moan about training. What mentality is this? And I do agree. I think there's poor mentality moaning about training. But there's been this, it's more been a report rather than a moan for months and months and months that players think they need to do more tactical work and less intense drills in training because apparently it ties them out for matches, which might be an excuse. But I also do think there's a little bit of something in that to be fair to the players and you know me I always call out the players for making up excuses and being silly and stuff but I, I, I feel like I will be lenient a little bit lenient with those leagues now talking of Tenor talking about the manager situation before I get into some news on Mason Mount before I get into some more news and updates I do want to talk about the latest on the manager front big everybody in the chat let's see if we can get 100 likes predictions for Sunday I'm going to say 1-1 one, one. I'm going to say we, we keep it a boring draw versus Liverpool uh, hopefully we can get a result again but we are on 100 likes, so figure out everybody in the chat. What is the latest on the manager front? And Megalodon, Meg, Megaloman, Me, 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 Megaloman, however you say your name, says, I don't get the hype about Nagelsmann, Eric Tenogas, more experience, CV and achievements. How do you feel about Nagelsmann? Let me know down below. McKenna's been doing great as well. I do worry about McKenna not having maybe the experience to make the jump from Ipswich to United, especially because the Manchester United players tried to get McKenna out under Rolly and said that he was an academy coach and should be coaching first team players, which is a shame, but that also shows the mentality of our players. But it was said by Miguel Delaney that Julian Nagelsmann is increasing interest to Manchester United should they despise to dispense with Tenog, Bayern Munich showing interest. And to tell you how good Nagelsmann is, Bayern Munich got rid of him, they now want him back because they realised that he's better than Toko and he's better than everyone else. Um, I think Julian Nagelsmann will be an option for United. You, the problem is, Bayern, Barcelona and Liverpool are all looking for a manager this summer. To Zerbi, Nagelsmann, Tuchel and Amarin are the four key managers about. Three of those managers are gone. We'll, we'll be left as Manchester United with whoever's left, which could be could be Nagelsmann, it could be De Zerbi. I don't think it will be Amarin, it could be Tuchel. I think Manchester United sacking Ten Hag, I understand with some of the performances why Ineos will do it. But I also think you've got to know you're getting a good manager in place. If we sat Ten Hag and we, and we don't have a manager lined up and then we end up having to bring in Southgate or Potter, or Gary O'Neill, and I like Gary O'Neill and Potter, but like this is Manchester United, we're not we're not Brighton. That's a problem. If Manchester United do want to bring in a new manager, if they do want to sat to Narg, they've got to make sure they've got some kind of verbal agreement from Nagelsmann or Amarin or, or someone. Um, I think Nagelsmann will go to Bayern Munich, if I'm going to be honest. I think Amarin will go to Liverpool, and I think Barcelona might go for De Zerbi or try and make a pull for Pep, try and make a pull for Pep. Um, and then I think United are left with someone like Tuchel if they, if they get rid of Ten Hag. Um, I, I, I think that because so many clubs are looking for a manager, maybe Chelsea will be, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, and I think Nagelsmann is one of the options, and I like Nagelsmann, 
But um, that's why I'd probably stick with Ten Hag because I think we could do something if we give Ten Hag a, a good. I generally think because of what Ten Hag achieved at Ajax and how well Ten Hag played at Ajax and the brilliant football that Ten Hag played at Ajax. Like I was a massive fan of Ten Hag at Ajax. I think with the right recruitment, we can achieve big things with Ten Hag. And I wanted to do well. And Zaga, he could do good for the next time he plays for. Steve makes a good point. Amarin, I hope he goes to Barcelona's potential wide worry about domestic rival. Yeah, his potential is insane. I did a video on my second channel about Amarin. He took over the Braga job. Um, and he was only there for three months and he basically won every game and won them the cup and then went to Sporting and won Sporting's first league title in 19 years in his first season. And he lost key players like Nunes and Agate and stuff and he still completely rebuilt that Sporting squad. What Amarin has done is absolutely incredible. Oli trashed Nagelsmann 5 nil. He did. He did. Um, I think I think he'll stay at Inter. Um, I think he'll stay at Inter. Someone said, could you not go for like Thiago and Motta maybe? Um, I can see I can see Enzaghi staying in turn. I think his reports are. It looks like Amarin is going to Liverpool as well, uh, but hopefully he doesn't because I think Amarin is, is going to be the next big thing in management. So I don't want to see him at Liverpool. In modern football, players need to talk uh, to complete multiple need, players need to complete multiple sprints to compete. Look at City, Arsenal, Liverpool stats 100%, and that's something that Man United players struggle to do, other than really Garnacho and a couple others as well. Nagelsmann man's management is a bit suspect, but he's tactically brilliant 100%, and that's the worrying thing because at Manchester United, we have players that don't suit tactically brilliant managers. And we have players that are problem causers. Is Nagelsmann as good as he is the right manager for United? Because Ten Hag was a tactical manager, Ragnar was a tactical manager, and it went completely wrong because the players didn't understand tactics. And maybe the man management there's lacked. Is, is, is man management more important than tactics at United? But it's, 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 that's, that's an interesting thing as well. Sesco is injury prone. I like Sesco, but I would I would go for Cirque with Sesco because of injuries and because I think Cirque is a little bit better and more experienced as well. United ran five kilometres less than Brentford and, and that doesn't surprise me. I wonder if they'll be going on a big run again. Uh, Amarin supposedly very good man management, very innovative with sports science. He's very data driven, very, very clever, very clever with the media. I mean, look, if, if Ten Hag was to go... Amarin will be my first choice. Um, and, and I hate to say this, but I just don't see him picking United over Barcelona, Liverpool and Bayern. I think he could pick us over a Bayern, maybe. Um, but I, I think I don't see him picking Man United over Liverpool just because I think managing Man United is almost a little bit like career danger at the moment. If you look at every manager post Rex Ferguson, it's not worked. Um, with him, you know, still raw and early in his career, has he got the confidence to take the challenge of United or would he go to Liverpool? Which, again, is immense pressure taking over from Jurgen Klopp, but there's still a bit more security at Liverpool because you know who you're working with. Michael Edwards, you know that Liverpool can succeed and you know you've got a better squad to inherit. Um, so I, I, part of me thinks he's probably going to end up going to Liverpool, but I, I do I do really like him. He'd be my first choice if we were to sack uh, Tenag Amarin for sure. Uh, uh, Palinja... Yeah, Palinja is one that's interesting. Um, I don't know if Palinja is 100% what we need as a DM, just because of limitations on the ball. I really think Tenag deserves to serve as United manager for one more season with a new structure, um, but I see why fans are getting humped. I'm with you. I'm, I'm the exact same as you, Carl. I think I'd like to see Tenag given a good summer, good structure, good recruitment, see what he can do next season because he did such a good job at Ajax and he showed a lot in his first season, and I think this could just be a bad blip. But I also understand why fans want Ten Hag sacked and why Ineos might want Ten Hag sacked because Ten Hag comes out in post-match interviews and defends the number of shots we concede. No, the number of shots we concede is a disgrace and that is massively because of your setup of low, 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 narrow defence, high, high pressing attack, big hole in the middle. You're not changing that. So I understand why people want Ten Hag sacked because the tactics are bad, the football is bad, some of his post-match comments are big red flags. But I'm like you, I'd love to see him just see what he can do with some good recruitment this summer because, again, the manager market is going to be incredibly difficult the Martinez injury happened in training yes going into a player that was injured a player that I love is Mason Mount um, it obviously was said here that this uh, and I want to get into this Mason Mount report but Mason Mount sadly has basically missed this whole season for injury and we might as well just got him on a free now we might as well got him on a free and he's obviously been struggling a bit for injury which is such a shame but he did come back he did score he's all ready for the Chelsea game I'd love it if Mason Mount got a goal versus Chelsea that would be absolutely brilliant but let's dive into some more news let's dive into some more information let's dive into some more stories starting with this one on Mason Mount it said their sentiment that fans had forgotten that Mason Mount played for United hurt him it's been particularly hard because he's been so desperate to make a good first impression 
at Manchester United. And I do feel a bit sorry for Mason Mount because I think not many people were excited by the signing. I said I think it's a good signing, but I wasn't necessarily sure why we made him our priority signing. And I, I think, you know, he's got the number seven. There was expectation. People weren't super hyped about the signing. He wants to make a good impression. He was OK in pre-season. He, he wasn't the worst player when he played, but he wasn't the best. He was very six out of ten. He was better than most of our players, but he weren't great. And it has said that Mason Mount did find the transition from Chelsea to Manchester United difficult to navigate. He was disappointed by the characterisation of him that left Stamford Bridge for financial reasons when the decision was made above his head, he said. Um, he doesn't like how he's been characterised. And that Ten Hag and his staff have, although, been really pressed with Mason Mount's determination to get back as quickly as possible. His determination to come off versus Brentford and not just score, but he made a good dribble, he made a good pass as well. It was said that during Mason Mount's injury layoff, he asked to be part of the team meetings that he wasn't required to attend in an effort to make sure he's up to speed with instructions and ready to return as soon as possible. I like that. I rate Mason Mount's mentality. You know, whether you rate Mason Mount as a player or not, he's got a very good mentality on him. It was, it was, it, it meant long days at Carrington, and there were many occasions where he was the last player to leave. Jurgen Klopp was in regular contact with Mason Mount in January 2023 at one stage. Meanwhile, talks of Arteta got so advanced that Arteta probably told coaches that Mount's transfer to the Emirates was a done deal. Hear that out there. And this is why, I, again, and it sounds like a silly thing to say, it might sound like a silly thing to say, but the fact that Klopp and Arteta wanted Mason Mount, and he, it says to me how how good he, he can be. And he was a very good player at Chelsea. I don't think he was necessarily the profile of midfielder we need, but there's definitely a good player in there. And there's a reason why top clubs, top clubs wanted him as well. A hundred percent. It's a disgrace how many injuries have been caused during training. We need to change the training routines. I, I agree with that as well. It's really causing a problem. I really like Mason Mount at Chelsea. Says Carlo will come good. I think Mason Mount will become good. And I think Mason Mount will become a really good player as well. But still 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 tricky finding making some Mount's ideal place. He isn't quick or dynamic enough for the wing and isn't and isn't or a physical weight we need. It's difficult. Mason Mount's almost you think of our best lineup and he's not in it. Um that that's difficult. But then I guess that's the good quality on the bench. He's someone that can play Bruno's role. His best position is Bruno's role, but Bruno isn't getting dropped. That is the one thing with Mason Mount. I think he's a good player that could have a lot of importance for us, but his best role is Bruno's role. And and that's where you think that could be difficult for him as well. But he was Chelsea's best player over the last basically three years. Um I saw a stat that Cole Palmer is the first it's like basically only Mason Mount has more goals than Cole Palmer in the last three years for Chelsea. Do you know what I mean? Like that just shows how important he was to Chelsea as well. Um, Mason Mount is a good player. Social media and player FC haters and lovers alike bringing up these slanderous takes on players. Yeah, I think Mason Mount's a good player. Was he the profile we needed? That's the question. I think Mason Mount's a good player that improved the squad. He was a very good player at Chelsea. There's a reason why Klopp and Arteta wanted him. It's a question mark about you know where his best role is and how we fit him in. But I, I do think in terms of Ericsson not having the legs and Mason Mount's pressing ability and off the ball work, 100%. And Bruno needs to be rotated more anyway and Mount should get a look in there exactly. It, you know, we're too reliant on Bruno. He never gets rested. He never gets rotated. And, and this would be a good opportunity for that as well. Um, I think, is that the last story? Have I got one more to get into? No, we've got more news to get into. That isn't the last story. We've still got more news to get into. We've still got more information to get into. Let's get into this report here. It was said that for the new chief operating officer role, keep an eye on Hugo Viana. He is well respected with Ineos and played a part in ensuring Bruno's transfer to Man United went smoothly as it could. It's thought that he's interested in working on the new project. So Hugo Viana is one to keep an eye on. He might be one that will be doing a role working with United, Nice and Lausanne in terms of a multi-club network because Ineos sort of have this plan to have basically, because they owe Man United, Lisa and the Son, to have this multi-club network where we'll be buying players for Nice that will eventually go to United and we'll be buying players for United that will be loaning to Nice, etc. Um, it was then also said that even if Tenor keeps his job at Man United, as Man United manager, he's going to have less control of the transfers under this new policy with Ineos and co-owners. And it looks like Ineos might be bringing people in, sorting the transfers, establishing how they want to play, and, and Eric Tenor just becomes the coach. You're not the manager anymore, you're the coach. You deal with the training, you deal with improving players, you deal with setting the team up, you deal with all of that. We're going to do the business outside. Um, and, and maybe that's what needs to be done. Eric Tenog, you know, he's done a lot of work on recruitment. He's done a lot of work on this. He's done a lot of work on that. Eric Tenog's recruitment hasn't been great. He's had to deal with this, this and that because of the incompetence above him. I think it's good if Ineos take a bit of power away from Tenog and say, we just want you to focus on improving players. We know you've improved the low, Mayno, Hoyland, Garnacho. We want you to focus on improving players. We want you to focus on improving the squad tactically. We're going to do the recruitment to give you the players that you'll need to play this way. We want to start seeing you trying to implement and playing this style of football because this style of football isn't good. And 
Ten Hag becomes the coach, not the manager, and 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 that little bit of power is taken off him. I think could be quite beneficial when you think of everything going on as well. He's the right profile for one of two eights, and I think there's a point. I do think that Ten Hag wants two eights, but Bruno and Mount are both tens. If you want an eight, sign a natural eight, not a ten, and play him as an eight. That was the big question for me about Mason Mount. I feel bad uh, for Hoyland doesn't get enough of the ball. I mean, the, the lack of service Hoyland gets is ridiculous. I, it frustrates me so much watching Manchester United, and I think we can't even give Hoyland one simple pass. I think poor Hoyland is just constantly starved. I do, I do feel sorry for the guy. Look, I rate Rasmus Hoyland. I think he's brilliant, but he's always completely starved by our club, isn't he? We're never given the ball. We're never given the ball. Eric Tenog's best bits have been rotating young players and his expanded role in the academy, 100%. And the thing is, whether you like Eric Tenog or not, what he has been very good at is bringing through Garnaccio, bringing through Corbyn, you know, development of Delo, I think development of Maynard and Garnaccio, you've seen, I think, development of Hoyland. I think he's, I think Eric Tenog is a ceiling raiser, not a floor raiser. Eric Tenog can't make average players play well. But if you're a player with good potential, he can make you become good. Frankie De Jong, De Ligt, Ajax, Gravenberg, Maserari. What Eric Ten is good at is if you bind the right players with the right attributes to play the way he wants to play, he can develop them well. But at Manchester United, out of his 16 signings, only 11 have been un not loan dips. Only five have been long-term. And of those five, uh, Mason Mount's been injured all season. All season. So that goes down to four. Um, I think Martinez has been out all season. That goes down to three. Anana Hoyland basically are the only two signings, unless you count Anthony. Um, Anana Hoyland and Anthony are the only three long term signings Ten Hag's made that's involved this season. So we're playing with players mostly that were built from Jose's underperformance, Oli's underperformance, Ragnar's underperformance. I think if they're the right players that are in there that are adaptable, Ten Hag can make them good. Like I, I, I still, and I know I'm not, I've, Ten Hag's tactics versus Brentford were a disgrace and we were awful versus Brentford. But I still think that Tenal can 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 make this team good. But yeah, we questioned a lot of lads. Eric Tenal got rid of out of the academy level, but he seemed to clear the way for better lads. Yeah, I was upset when Sedan Ickball went, but he's cleared the way for Mano, and I think that was quite smart business by Eric Tenal because Mano is is better than Sedan Ickball. You know, I question a lot of Tenal's decisions, but I think Tenal's proven to be right in, in those cases. And I'd like to be patient with Tenal, but yeah, I like Eric Tenal, but wonder the tactics and style. Yeah, there's no style. The tactics are bad. I understand why people want to knock out and people want to knock out because that performance was tactically awful. And even with the lack of players that we have, he should be doing better than that. But I also believe there's a good manager in there that I'd like to see him do well under good recruitment. I've always had that kind of stance on Eric Tenog, if, if you know what I mean as well. I, I just... I, mean, I just like Tenog. I'm going to be honest with you. I just like Tenog. I, I just... I'm fed up with Saka manager every two years. I really wanted him when he was at Ajax. I really, really wanted him because I really wanted him because of what he did at Ajax and I watched him at Ajax and how good Ajax played. I want to see that Ajax 10 Hag at Manchester United. I really want to see that Ajax 10 Hag at Manchester United because I think that Ajax 10 Hag was good as well. Um, continuing on as well, I can see Hoyland scoring more goals next season when he gets better service. I agree. I think Hoyland, we know, can score goals. It's just about service. 100%. Um, I think about how little we've seen Eric Tenog's first choice 11 this season due to injuries. Again, another thing as well. And the style ain't working because profile's wrong. Uh, yeah, I agree as well. There's not manager in the world that could deal with this team and the state it's in. So why does everyone keep talking about Eric Tenog doing a bad shouldn't this or that? I mean, he's not. I think we could have done a lot better versus Brentford. The way we were dominated is unacceptable. And part of that is on Tenog. But I do agree that I don't think Nagelsmann comes in and we just start playing brilliant football. I don't think Amoran comes and we start playing brilliant football. I think there's a lot, a lot of work to do. I understand why people want Ten Hag out after the Brentford display, but I personally am still Ten Hag in because I just think there's so much work that needs to be done as well. Leecher is out, and that, I, to be honest, I do think there's a bit of blame on Ten Hag for that. That a little bit is done with training and I think lack of planning there as well. But listen, people, I'm going to wrap up today's live show. It's been a good and long live show. I haven't done a long live show in a while. I will be back tonight. I'll either be back after the Arsenal game or just before. So make sure you've got that post notification bell on. Do subscribe if you want to stay up to date with all the latest Manchester United news, transfer news, takeover news, updates and more daily shows on the channel. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.